Okay, so let's start. Uh, welcome everybody to this new webinar, uh, overview of credit card fraud detection techniques. Before starting to talk uh, about credit card fraud detection, uh, I would like to have a quick review of what an anomaly or an outlier is. So, uh, an anomaly or an outlier is everything that stands out of the ordinary. So something that is not expected, not normal, at least with the data we are dealing with. For example, if we have an electrocardiographic signal and we have a sequence of normal beats, and then suddenly we have a, an arrhythmic beat, right? That would be an anomaly. If we have a, a electricity usage time series, right? Then we are going to have some oscillations, but nothing too extreme. And then suddenly we have a peak, uh, this is probably, uh, this is also an anomaly in the usage of electricity. If we have, for example, in the stock market, things are growing in a constant way, things are moving in a way that we expect and that suddenly something happens and uh, there is uh, an anomaly in the uh, behavior of the stock market, something that we don't expect. Um, if we have an image processing and we have a series of images <clears throat> and we know what to expect from these images and then we are looking for the one image outlier which is slightly different, which is different from the other images we are used to, we expect from the domain. We have a sequence of numbers. Again, uh, we have the one number that uh, sticks out that uh, um, is uh, different from all the other numbers in the sequence. And then when we talk about customers, we always have that uh, weird customer that uh, stands out from the rest of the customer base. So that's pretty much what an anomaly or an outlier is. Something that is out of the ordinary and something that we don't expect to find in the data. Um, so uh, the, the, good, the good news uh, is that for uh, anomaly and for outlier detection, there are a number of algorithms of techniques already available to uh, detect to find the outliers. For example, we can measure the distance from the median in the data set. We can uh, position, we can check the position of the data point in the distribution tails. So we can build a system of clusters and then we can measure the distance from the closest cluster. Uh, we can use a, not, a neural autoencoder or we can use an isolation forest. So those are all techniques that uh, exist and they, they are commonly used for outlier detection. We will see them in this presentation, in this webinar. So what does outlier have to do with credit card fraud? Well, uh, credit card uh, fraudulent credit card transactions are something that is statistically different from normal credit card transactions. So from, from this point of view, they can be seen as outliers. Is credit card fraud a big problem? Yes, it is. Of course, I, uh, if, the, if a, a fraudulent transaction happens, I lose money and that's of course a problem. Uh, is that a common problem? Uh, it is also a common problem. According to uh, the Nielsen report, for example, in uh, 2019, there has been a $27 billion loss due to credit card frauds. Not only that, this uh, $27 billion loss is an increase of the 16% with respect to uh, the loss in 2017. So yes, it is a problem, it is money, and it's a growing problem in time. So if we are able to prevent uh, fraudulent credit card transactions, of course, we are able to save money and so on and so on. So it's a, uh, it's a good solution for a problem to have. In a perfect world, um, I would have um, a data set. The data set would have a number of examples for credit card transactions. Uh, it would have probably uh, labels, so it would be a label data set, two classes, some examples for legitimate transactions and some examples for fraudulent transactions. So in a perfect world, I would take this data set, I would build my training set, my test set, I would train a supervised model, for example, a logistic regression or a random forest or another supervised model. Uh, I would train it on the training set. I, then, I would then apply it on the test set. I would get some performance measure. I would be happy with the performance, for performance measure. And then finally, I would deploy the model out in the world and then I would be able to prevent all fraud. Uh, fraudulent transactions. That's the perfect world. 
in the real world, uh, I need labeled data. Often data, a data set is not labeled. Even if it's labeled, I have a very large amount of legitimate transactions and very few uh, 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 fraudulent transactions. So, so I mean, it, it, I need to have enough examples of labeled fraudulent transactions, and this doesn't always happen. I need large amounts of historical data. And also what happens often in the real world is that uh, the fraudulent people are quite smart and they change the patterns of the fraud uh, often. So that means that I need to frequently update uh, my data set with new data and frequently retrain my supervised model to adapt to the changes in patterns of fraud. So as we see, the uh, real world is a bit more complicated than the uh, uh, ideal world. So let's see uh, the data set that we want to use for these, uh, uh, for the experiments in this webinar that we will describe in this webinar. It is the Kaggle data set. It includes <clears throat> 280,000 credit card transactions. Uh, these credit card transactions come from September 2013 and European card holders. Each transaction is described by 28 principal components, then the time from the first transaction, and then, of course, the amount of money uh, associated with the transaction. There are two classes, um, legitimate transactions and uh, um, fraudulent transactions. Okay, so, so far so good. The only thing that uh, uh, is mm, complicated, let's say, in this data set is the number of fraudulent transactions. Of these 284,000 credit card transactions, the, the highest majority is legitimate transactions. Only for 192, the 0.2% uh, are fraudulent transactions. With such a small number of fraudulent transactions, I cannot train uh, successfully a supervised model. So this is a, a frequent problem in uh, uh, credit card data. We have a lot of uh, normal legitimate transactions and then we have only a few of labeled fraudulent transactions. So in this case, then what do we do? Uh, we need to, um, we decided to uh, abandon the um, supervised learning uh, strategy and we decided to adopt some of the um, outlier detection techniques, for example, uh, based on quantile, on distributions, on clustering, or the neural autoencoder, or the isolation forest. And then these techniques have the good advantage that they don't need labeled data. So I can only do with the legitimate transactions, and then based on uh, uh, the statistical properties of the data set, I can um, suppose that uh, one data point might be uh, a fraud. So it's a fraud alarm. Doesn't mean it's, a, it's really a fraud, but at least it's a fraud alarm. So let's start with these uh, um, outlier detection techniques and we start with the quantile based technique. So Marit, uh, I'll pass the Thank you. Um, talk to you. Rosaria for the introduction and also welcome everybody also from my side. And I will share my screen. So I will now go a bit more in detail into the techniques that Rosaria introduced to you. So how to detect outliers, how to detect fraud uh, in using the data set we have with only a very, very few fraudulent, uh, fraudulent transactions in it. We will first take a look at the box plot and you see a box, box plot here. So what you see here in the middle is the median. And this is now one feature of a transaction. It could be one of the, or it is one of the principal components. Why we are talking about principal components, not about uh, interpretable features, because we are handling with our uh, handling confidential data. And then here on both sides of the median, you see the first quantile, and then you see the third quantile and you see lower and upper whiskers. And these make now the box plot. These lower and upper whiskers are calculated using this formula, where we first of all use this distance between the first and third quantile, and we multiply it by a parameter k. And then we subtract it from the first quantile 
or we add it to the third quantile. And the parameter k is not predefined, but with this parameter we can regulate how uh, strict we are for the outlier detection. So if we define a large value of k from 3, 4, and so on, then we tolerate more extreme values because the whiskers become farther towards the extremes in the data. If we define a low value for the k, low absolute value for the k, we don't tolerate much deviation from the uh, first and third quantiles. And now you see the data points that lie outside, so below or uh, below the lower whisker or above the upper whisker, they are then the outlier points. So this is a very easy and also easy to interpret way of detecting outliers, but it also has some challenges. So it's not said that the data that we have, this feature that we have, it's very normal. It, the more it has weird features, the more it has fraudulent-like features, the more expanded towards the extremes where we expect the fraudulent transactions to lie are also these quantiles. So with a lot of fraudulent transactions or fraudulent behavior in our transactions data, the uh, spread of the what is between first and third quantile it's too wide. Then we have to define this parameter k and here you see for example that we have outliers that are too low in terms of this uh, uh, the value of this feature or that are too high but at the low end the spread is much more than at the uh, upper end. And by this simple technique, we can only apply one value of k, although it might be, make sense to have here a, a larger value for the k and here a lower value for the k. And of course, this is possible just by duplicating this process or repeating it two times and applying it first to the uh, lower outliers and then to the upper outliers separate. And here we see we only have one dimension, but we might want to consider the outliers in terms of multiple dimensions. How do we then implement this box plot technique in NIME? And here you see an, a workflow for that. And somebody, someone already asked in the chat, uh, do we get the slides? Do we get, maybe you ask, do we get the workflows? Yes, we will distribute links to the workflows and uh, links to the slides after the webinar. But here you see the key note for detecting outliers by a box plot in NIME, and it's this numeric outliers node. So here you can select all the numeric columns that you use for outlier detection, and then also define the parameter K. So how, uh, far do the outliers have to be from the median or from the first and third quantiles to be outliers. Then there is also something else in this workflow. And this is because now we have labeled data, so we can directly compare this techniques performance using the classification model evaluation metrics. And since the performance might change a bit, if we change the value of K, we built a parameter optimization loop around training or around um, applying this technique so that we find the optimal value for the key. And you see, we, for this data, it's around, oh, it's 3.3 based on recall and precision. And here we then apply the same technique using the optimal parameter value. I would introduce two more techniques and then we will take a look at this evaluation metrics, recall and precision, and how these techniques perform in terms of them. Before that, we take a look at the second technique, and that is Z-score. And how does this technique work? So here we assume that one feature is normally distributed, like there is one of the principal, at least one of the principal components in the data seems to be. Here it's plotted together with the standard normal distribution. And then we define values, set values 
which are the threshold, and define all the data points that lie out in the distribution tails. So the normalized values are in absolute terms greater than the threshold. So here, these would be, for example, the uh, outlines. Again, a very uh, easy, easy technique to detect, detect outliers, but with some challenges. The first one is that the data needs to be uh, normally distributed. And you can later check in the workflow and check the distributions of the principal components or of the other features that we have on the transactions. Not all of them are normally distributed. So we can only apply this technique to the normally distributed features. Then the normal distribution has parameters, which are mean and standard deviation. But you know, some statistics are very sensitive to outliers, and mean is one of them. So if you again have some weird behavior in the data, maybe some of the uh, uh, data in the training sets are fraudulent, they of course skew the distribution. So the mean is then uh, shifted to the right or to the left. Or you have time series data, for example, the transactions for the whole last year, and the mean of the data is not stable. Maybe in terms of this feature that you are modeling, the mean value is higher in summer than it's in winter, or there's some seasonality, maybe weekly seasonality. And then the mean is not stable and this technique is not working anymore. And how to apply this technique or how to implement this technique in a nine workflow? You see an example here. So we have normalized the data and then we have checked one dimension, which is uh, almost normally distributed and we have selected the fifth uh, principal component. Then using this row filter node, we exclude all the normalized values that lie outside the range defined by the set value, so by the threshold value. Of course, also here, finding the optimal Z value depends on the data that you have. And you cannot say uh, by first try, it's the best one. And that's why we also built here a parameter optimization loop along, around the process so that we find the threshold, sorry, that gives us the best precision, combination of precision and recall. For this data, it seems to be three. And then we again filter the data according to the best, best filtering criteria. And before we come to the comparison of these techniques, there is one more technique that I'd like to introduce and it's the DB scan. So it's a clustering based method. What is the DB scan clustering method actually doing? It flags data points that don't fit the clustering structure as a noise, noise points. And we say these noise points are then the outliers, the fraudulent transactions. And the clusters are built based on the densities in the feature space. So every data point in the feature space, like you see here, is either a core point, a border point, or a noise point. Now we already know these outliers, they are the noise points. What are then core points and border points? They are, in any case, they are here, they appear within the clusters. And to build the clusters, we need to define two parameters, and they are the min points and epsilon. And every core point in a cluster needs to have within the distance of epsilon, at least min points uh, number of other data points around it. And border points, they need to be within the distance epsilon from a core point, but they don't need to have as many neighbors as the core points have. And by defining these values, min points and epsilon, we can then find groupings that consists of uh, core points and border points. Here you see in this picture, 
at least for this data, the, ver the clustering works quite nicely. So we have here dense groupings, clearly separated from each other, and then outliers that don't fit any of the group or any of the cluster. But with our data, this technique again has some challenges. So the first thing is that it's very slow. So it has a quadratic runtime. And together with the large amount of the data that we are handling, 300,000 in the our example data set, and also with uh, the feature of the trans, uh, transactions data that the everyday credit card usage as well as the fraudulent behavior, they change rapidly. So the model needs to be retrained often and therefore the slow runtime of this algorithm is of, uh, it's not good for this. And then to find good values, the optimal values for the min points and epsilon, we would need to iterate over several clusterings and select the best one. Since by changing slightly the min points or epsilon, we might come with a different clustering structure that is actually performing better. But this would require repeating the process of clustering multiple times and increase the runtime even more. And also here, what you see is a nice example of clusters which have equal density within them. But it's not said that this is the case for when we are handling transactions data. So there might be some groups of credit card customers that are very similar in terms of their credit card behavior, and then some more uh, individual credit card usage behavior that form rather sparse or uh, not so dense clusters. So if the clusters are not equally dense, then this it reduces the performance of this clustering method. And how to implement this technique in NIME? We have this DB scan node that forms the clusters and assigns each data point into a cluster. And the clusters are calculated based on the numeric distances, for example, Euclidean distances between the features. And again, since we have uh, the information on the actual status of each transaction, was it fraudulent or not? we can compare the technique of this or the performance of this technique with the classification model evaluation techniques. And now we have already the first three techniques, box plot, then the Z score and DB scan, and we can compare these. And how do we then compare them? Of course, there are many different techniques to evaluate the classification model and to evaluate the performance of fraud detection in this case. But we now have this use case of fraud detection and we use these two st statistics which tell us, first of all, the recall. So how many of the fraudulent transactions were prevented by the model? We are interested how much value is added to the 30 billion last year so how much is the money loss, uh, expected money loss, because our model fails to find fraudulent transactions. So these statistics tells how, what is the proportion of actually detected fraudulent transactions. You can calculate it based on the values in the confusion matrix using this formula here. On the other hand, it's not only that we find, want to find all the fraudulent transactions, we also want to provide good service to the credit card users and not contact them always after every transaction they make or prevent the transaction. So we all are also interested in the precision of the model, meaning how many fraud alarms actually hit or hit a fraudulent transaction. Here you can see how to calculate the precision using the values in a confusion matrix. So this means the higher the precision, the more probably a prevented transaction actually is a fraudulent transaction. And here you see these two statistics, recall and precision for the three models or three techniques 
that I introduced. And there is one winner technique in terms of the recall, and it's the box put, meaning the most tran fraudulent transactions are found by the box plot method. The worst in this uh, re in terms of the recall is the Z score and BB scan is there in between. On the other hand, none of the techniques is performing well in terms of precision. So these techniques wouldn't be very, uh, would lead to many false alarms. But the performance is not the only criterion when we select which model would best fit for our uh, fraud detection use case. We are also interested how fast it is to train the model and uh, use the model. And you see quantile based and distribution based, so box plot and Z score, they are pretty easy uh, and fast to train. So it takes less than, less than two minutes, even with this large uh, data set. Whereas for the VB scan, this clustering based method, which I already want, is very slow. It takes for this data set half an hour to build the clusters only with one parameter, combination of the parameter that. And since we are not yet happy with this performance that we get using these a bit more simple techniques, I will now give over to Rosaria. She will introduce some a bit more advanced techniques with which we can also improve the performance for fraud detection. Okay, so let's step up the game a bit and let's uh, go into some more uh, slightly more complicated um, uh, slightly more complicated uh, techniques. So the first one that we tried was the neural autoencoder. Uh, I don't know if you know it already, I'll give a little bit of a summary. So the neural autoencoder is a neural network, a classic neural network. So it's trained with backpropagation, it's feed forward, so nothing really exotic about this neural network. The only particularity of the autoencoder stays in the architecture of the neural network and the architecture um, requires as many input units as many output units. Um, so I'm going to have an input layer with as many input units as, as uh, the units in the output layer. Then I'm going to have a number of hidden layers, an odd number of hidden layers, and then I'm going to train my network to reproduce the input vector onto the output layer. In our particular case, I'm going to train the network to uh, reproduce the input vector onto the output layer using only the legitimate transactions in the data set. So my network is going to be able to learn to reproduce legitimate transactions from the input onto the output. Once I've trained the network, I'm satisfied with the network, I'm going to deploy my network into the real world. When a new credit card transaction is presented at the input layer of the neural network, then the network is going to try to reproduce it on the output layer. If it's a legitimate transaction, it's going to make a good job because, uh, I mean, it, it, that's what it has learned. It has learned to reproduce legitimate transactions. So that shouldn't be a problem, more or less. I mean, not exactly, but it's going to reproduce quite faithfully the um, transaction at the input layer. However, if I have a uh, fraudulent transaction, it's going to be a much harder task for the network because the network was not trained with fraudulent transactions. So it's going to reproduce something, but it's not going to do, to do a as a good job as for a legitimate transaction. So what I'm going to do then at this point, I can calculate the distance between the input and the output layer. And if this distance is very low, then probably it's a legitimate transaction. If this distance is very high, then it's probably a fraudulent transaction. So I need to define a threshold. Above this threshold, I'm going to fire a fraud alarm. Below this threshold, I'm going to assume that the transaction is legitimate. It's quite a powerful method because, of course, you can make the network as complex as you want and then add degrees of nonlinearity to the network. But, of course, there is a price to pay. Uh, like all the neural networks, it has low interpretability, so you don't know why an input uh, transaction has been uh, uh, labeled as an alarm, as a fraud alarm. So this is the low interpretability of the neural networks. And also it requires large amounts of data for the training. 
the neural autoencoder, an example uh, to make it more clear how it works, uh, uh, it was uh, used, for example, a lot for uh, numbers. So, so if I have a data set made only of handwritten digits, uh, the network is going to reproduce the handwritten digit uh, at the input layer onto the output layer. So it's trained only on digit images, right? So when I uh, am going to move the network onto real numbers, onto real, uh, in, onto real handwritten digits in the real world, then I see a digit and it's going to make a relatively good job in reproducing the input digits onto digit onto the output layer. I calculate the distance between the image and the input and the Im image at the output and the distance is small. However, if something out of the domain, like for example, a letter is going to be presented at the input of the autoencoder, then the autoencoder is not going to be able to reproduce a letter because it has never seen a letter during the training phase. In this case, it's going to produce something at the output layer and the distance that I calculate between the output layer and the input layer is going to be much larger. So that's the, pr the principle of the autoencoder. So we apply this principle then also for the uh, to distinguish between legitimate and uh, um, fraudulent transactions. This is the workflow that we used for uh, the um, uh, to, to um, impl uh, implement and train the network. So you can see we use the Keras integration, the Nime Keras integration. So all these nodes up here, they all represent one layer in the autoencoder. Uh, notice that here, this layer, the input layer has 30 units, and this is the output layer, which is also, which has also 30 units. And that was the requirement for the, for the autoencoder. All these other layers are in the middle and they are five. So an odd number of hidden layers, uh, units 40, 28. So the bottleneck here is eight unit in the central layer. So once I build this network, I prepare my data, I divide them in a, um, a, a training set, I, an evaluation set that I'm going to feed into the network learner uh, to uh, periodically test my um, uh, the progress of my network, and then an, a test set that I'm going to use. Uh, uh, I'm going to use to define the uh, optimal threshold k. You remember, I needed a threshold on the distance. Above this threshold is a fraud alarm. Below this threshold is a legitimate transaction. So I'm going to use this last uh, small data set to optimize the value of the threshold for the fraud alarm. This is the node that trains the network. This is the node that applies the network, and this is the meta node that con the uh, component that contains a loop and uh, this loop is an optimization loop that allows me to define the optimal threshold uh, k. The workflow is available at this link here on the NIME hub. Okay, so the isolation forest now is uh, for Marit to explain. Okay. So thank you, Rosaria, for explaining the autoencoder. And now we have another, a bit more advanced technique, and it's called the isolation forest. So let's take a look how this works then. Here you see in two-dimensional feature space, our transactions. So the circles are the normal transactions, and then the stars are the fraudulent transactions. And the idea is to isolate these data points from the these fraudulent data, uh, transactions from the normal ones by random splits in the data set. So let's see. We now randomly select a feature and a point in the feature uh, within the range of the feature, like this. Now we randomly selected the X2 and this point there. Of course, for this demonstration, we are working with only two dimensions. In the reality, the dimensions are many more. What happens? We split the data into two, above and below. And none of the transactions is isolated yet from the others. But we repeat this again. Now we selected the dimension x1 and this point there. And actually, only by two splits, we have already isolated this fraudulent transaction, and also this fraudulent transactions. And what you see here on the right happening is a tree growing. So with this splitting, 
we actually create values for a statistic that we are going to use to define the transactions, the data points as uh, outliers or not, as fraudulent or legitimate. And the statistics is called mean length. And for example, for these two data points, the length is two because they were isolated from the others already by two splits. So at the second level in the tree. We continue this now, three. Now the three length is three. We have three splits, four splits, five, six, and so on. And the length is six also for these, two for these, and it doesn't take many more transactions or splits until we have isolated all the fraudulent transactions. Meaning the length is somewhere between seven and two to the fraudulent transactions, but we would need to continue this random splitting uh, way longer until we had isolated all the data points here in the, as part of the crowd, so the normal transactions. What would happen in the tree? We would reach a very, very long tree and only end at the very high level until we have isolated all the data points. Why is it called mean length? This is because since we use here randomization, we might make a bad choice just randomly and isolate a data point by few splits that is actually part of the crowd, so a normal transaction, and we reduce this possibility by repeating the process so we consider the mean length when we have repeated the process of splitting multiple times. This is actually a very fast technique and it performs quite nicely for fraud, also for fraud detection, as you will see later. But the downside of that is that the low interpretability of this model. So let's check first how to implement this technique in a NIME workflow. And here we use the H2O integration in NIME. So the H2O machine learning library integrated in NIME is optimized for fast, uh, for speed, so that we can uh, handle large data sets, like we now have the large data set of transactions. And there we have the isolation forest learner node and the predictor node, which we then apply to the data set that we have. Then we define a threshold for the mean length statistics to say which of the data in the test set are fraudulent, predicted as fraudulent, which are not, and compare them to the actual labels that we have on the data. So were they, were they actually fraudulent or not? Now we have, again, two techniques to compare, autoencoder and isolation forest. And we compare them in terms of recall and precision. Rosaria introduced the autoencoder and you saw it's a very sophisticated model. You can in, do a lot of tuning there. You can add layers and you can change many of the parameters. But already with the implementation that we introduced, we see the autoencoder is performing quite well, both in terms of recall and precision. So the autoencoder performs or finds almost a half of all the fraudulent transactions way more than the techniques introduced before and also more than the isolation forest. And also in terms of precision, the autoencoder performs the best. So this technique doesn't raise too many uh, false alarms. Also in terms of precision, the autoencoder performs better than the isolation forest. However, the autoencoder is a complicated, is a sophisticated model and you see it also here in this execution time comparison. So it, for this data, for this model, what I was doing on my machine, it took one hour to execute the auto, uh, encoder model. Whereas for the isolation forest, it took uh, less than one minute. So this is the cost what, that comes with the uh, great accuracy of the autoencoder. And with this, we have now covered the details of all the techniques that we want to introduce here in this webinar. 
and we have collected them in a workflow. Um, um, Marit, there is a question, um, yeah. so I would like to answer yeah. it now. Um, so there is uh, somebody is asking, um, how can we perform a classification if uh, the, we thought that there were no classes? So the data set we had had a few fraudulent uh, transactions uh, for 100 and 27, something like that. So we use these few fraudulent transactions as the test set to, to see if our approach that was trained without using fraudulent transactions is actually working to detect them. Am I correct, Marit? This is correct. So uh, without the information on the actual uh, class labels, fraudulent or no fraudulent, we couldn't say which, which of these is better. So we use the information to compare the techniques. Exactly, but not in the training because it was not enough. Yes. Okay. Thank you for uh, jumping in. If there are any other questions that should be answered at this point, I'm. Uh, we it's can okay, we can continue. Yeah. Okay, and here you have the workflow where we collect all these techniques. So, box plot, Z score, DB scan. Then isolation forest and auto encoder, and for comparison, you also have there the machine learning implement, and you can now uh, also download it, yeah. test it, improve it, uh, so take it from the nine hub, and you can take a more detailed look at it. This workflow is now uh, for the use case fraud detection, but we also have for anomaly detection another workflow where we implement the techniques, many of them introduced or all of them were also part of today's webinar. And here the use case is to detect which airports are outliers in the US in terms of uh, arrival delays. So with especially many of you arrival delays. And here you see the use cases where you can use these out outlier detection techniques are quite many. If you are more interested in the theory, what we said today about fraud detection, about anomaly detection, about these different techniques, we have also explained them in more detail in blog posts that we have published also in external journals. So for example, on Dataversity and InfoQ. So via these links, you can access these articles. And of course, in our blog that we publish weekly, you will find more articles on these topics topics and other, other interesting topics, of course. I would like to conclude our, our part of the presentation. And if there are other questions, Rosaria and me are, of course, happy to answer them now. So there was a question um, I, I answered, but I, I think it's of general interest. So I'm going to repeat it. Um, they were asking if all the outliers uh, are going to be labeled as fraud alarms and if that's not a problem because it would generate a lot of false positives. So a fraud alarm is not necessarily a fraud. It has to be verified and probably uh, the, the number of false positives would be high. Um, so I, I can answer this question. Uh, it's true. Uh, the, all these uh, techniques that we have explained today, they are prone to false positives, but they are kind of the desperate solution. So we have a data set which is not labeled or very with very few examples of the fraudulent transactions. So what can we do? We have to use a technique that uh, j just looks for outliers. Uh, there are going to be a lot of false positives. In some cases, false positives are not tolerable. For example, if you are in a hospital and you have to make a diagnosis, the false positive is not tol tolerable. But in our case, it's an SMS uh, or, or some kind of message sent to the owner of the credit card. Might be wrong. Maybe the, the, the owner of the credit card did run a legitimate transaction that looked fraudulent. Okay, nothing. He's going to say, okay, it wasn't, it was me, everything fine. So it, uh, the, the tolerance for sp false positives in this use case is very high. Okay. They want to see the, uh, yeah, perfect. There is a question, I, I one practical question, which courses and are eligible for the discount. So they are the two next courses, one for the machine learning algorithm starting next week, 
if you see it here on the slides, and the second one for the advanced data science course starting in uh, the week after. Sorry if it went too fast. So there is a question about uh, why we were excluding outliers as opposed to analyzing the accounts. We, we didn't have account information. We had only transactions. In the transaction space, we had legitimate transactions and then we had transactions that were outliers. We assumed that all the outlier transactions could be fraud. So in case of uh, a detected outlier transaction, we would fire a fraud alarm. So that's, uh, yeah. I mean, we don't know if it's a true fraud. We don't know. We would send a double step of verification uh, to the owner of the credit card and, and then it would be, as I said, it could be a false positive or it could be a real fraud. Um, in the end, we could also, you know, you could, you, we didn't do that. But once you have identified the outliers, you could also define that the outliers with a lot of money, you send the, the message or you, you enable a verification. Uh, but the, the uh, outliers with not a lot of money, maybe you let them go. I don't know. So this is more a banking strategy than just an outlier detection strategy. There is one suggestion for oversampling. This is a very good point. So normally when we have very unbalanced data, the algorithm will perform better uh, when we oversample. So we make the data, force the data to become balanced by oversampling the minority class. And, but in this case, the unbalance in the data is so high. And if we oversample, we skew, skew the features of the data quite largely. So it might not result in, in an optimal performance uh, either. Plus that we wanted to introduce the techniques that work for the normal case where we don't know of the transactions, whether they are fraudulent or not. But for the machine learning case, you can do many things to improve the performance there and the oversampling is one of them. Okay, so there are two questions I would like to answer. So the first one is how do you determine the number of uh, layers in an autoencoder? Uh, if that can be optimized or predefined. So usually, as I said, it's a not number. Uh, of course, the more hidden layers you introduce, the more complex the architecture becomes. That means it can do more things, but it's also, it takes much longer to train and it can run into local, min into local minima, so it might be more complicated to train. So I would say, if you predefine them, don't exaggerate. So we use the five hidden layers. I would say that's already quite a lot. So depending on the space, on the dimensionality of the space of the, uh, of the input, um, I would say, I don't know, something um, like between maximum 10. Uh, you can optimize that, of course, of course, anything can be optimized, uh, but that's, uh, I mean, you can, in a, especially in the autoencoder, in a neural network, you, you can optimize a lot of stuff, a lot of parameters. Of course, the more you optimize, the longer uh, the training and the optimization and uh, the, this workflow becomes, of course, the, the, the slower it becomes. Um, right, and then the next one is, uh, um, how many are indeed fraud? So that was the bar chart that Marit uh, was showing. So the question is, if we know how many of the fraud alarm were actually uh, frauds, and that's the precision uh, in the bar chart that Marit was showing. If you want to show that again, Marit. Let me go back to the, for example, here. Right. So here you have that an 80% of, for the autoencoder, for example, 80% of um, what was labeled as a fraud alarm was actually a fraud. So this is the precision measure, exactly. And uh, here for the, um, sorry, for the uh, isolation forest, you have a, a bit more than 60% of what was generated as a fraud alarm was actually a fraud. So yes, we did measure that. For the question, is recall and precision is, uh, everything that is below 0 0.5 bad, I would avoid introducing strict threshold and saying this is good, this is bad. It always depends on the use case that you have. And we have a blog post also on that where we introduce the cost and profit to the interpretation of the classification results. So there you can also calculate what does it mean in practice uh, 
if the recall is this much and the precision is this much. And you can in, uh, communicate the results in terms of money instead, term, instead of terms of statistics. I can send the link in the chat. There is another question about balancing the samples. Okay, so the oversampling and the undersampling, when we have uh, um, a not evenly distributed uh, data set across the classes, we usually, you know, you can use the undersampling or the oversampling to end up with uh, an evenly distributed data set. And that's the, okay, you can do that. The problem is that in credit card uh, transactions, uh, it's not even, uh, unevenly distributed, that's a rare event. So when you have so few of the fraudulent transactions that even if you start doing this smoting, for example, applying the smoting, the oversampling or the under, the undersampling you cannot do because at the end you end up with a very few legitimate transactions as many as the fraudulent transactions and, and it's too, too few. And also the oversampling doesn't work because then you repeat and repeat the same uh, examples that are just too few to describe the whole uh, landscape of frauds. So in this case, when uh, instead of being, cons it's not, this data set is not considered as much as a, um, an evenly distributed data set, it's more considered, considered as a data set with rare events. When you have rare events, then the one of the option is to end up with outlier detection. I mean, but we can try also doing the oversampling uh, of the minority class and see what happens. I mean, probably it's worth it, but smoting is already long. Uh, we should undersample the legitimate transactions. I don't know, at the end, uh, maybe the outlier detection uh, is a good solution when you don't have a lot of examples. And in some, in some case you have no examples. So you have very like one or two fraudulent transactions and that's definitely not enough even for oversampling for uh, applying this mode procedure. I hope I was clear. Yeah, so the, the, there is another question about the class imbalance. So was I clear? So this is not just a simple class imbalance problem. This is a rare event problem. One of the two classes is so little populated that even, so we cannot use the undersampling even using the oversampling might not be enough to describe all the landscape of fraudulent transactions out there. So that's why we ended up with outlier detection strategies. Bagging and undersampling is the same, uh, it's, it's the same um, answer that I've, I've given. Also the bagging, if you do the undersampling, you end up with very few legitimate transactions and very few fraudulent transactions. The begging has a lot of parameters. At the end. It's just uh, an ill-conditioned problem. Okay. Okay. I think we have no more questions, or do we? You are going to get, yeah, you are going to get the slides at the end of this webinar, so no worry about that. Okay. Then I think we can close here if there are no more questions. Thank you very much, everybody. Yeah. And uh, I hope to see you at the next webinar. Uh, we have many planned, so at the next webinar. Thank you and bye. Have a nice evening. Bye.